Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to part four of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way. We're getting into some valuable insights from this week's guests that you can definitely apply to your own journey. Please definitely stay tuned for advice and inspiration that can help us all. If you missed the first part of the week in part one, two, and three, definitely go back. The show notes should be filled with all the links, so go and click on them if you need to catch up. Also, definitely subscribe to the channel and all the other ones if you can. It's going to really help the show. But for now, enjoy the rest of the story. Let's talk. You, you said it intensified going into high school. Yes. How did it intensify for you then? Well, it really was a lot better for me academically. I was in all regular ed classes except for math uh, and a resource room. Socially, it got a lot. It, it, it did intensify. A lot of our groups uh, became more defined. Peer groups became a lot more uh concrete and I didn't feel like I fit in with anybody's group and mm. it seemed like that I did I just didn't fit in and nobody really liked me and uh, the, a lot of the bullying just really started getting a lot better sometimes I even got into some threats and threats that, yes it, it can did. you share some and, threats with us yes there was some yeah I can remember the one that was uh, telling me that she was going to harm me and luckily this was nothing. I mean, this was just to get me going. Cause I remember I was seeing an older guy and he was like, I was telling him about this and he goes, you know, you really should just act like it doesn't bother you next time she, she tries something. So I'll never forget her face. She was telling me that she was going to kill me. And I looked at her and I said, Oh, that's nice. Have a good day. And she, her mouth, her, her jaw just dropped like, <laughs> And I never really had too much of an issue with her afterwards. And I think she moved out of her district uh, for for that, for my senior year. But her jaw just dropped like she was just in shock. And I am so blessed that she didn't act on any of that. Because I did tell certain school members and they, they didn't really do very much with a lot of that. And I think it was, you know, it just... it. I started to feel more like I just didn't belong with, with the people that I went to school with. And I can just remember when I did find that group outside of school, it made it so much easier for me when I did go into school. And sometimes when I was being picked on, because I had that acceptance, I can kind of read through that and think, okay, that person doesn't like me. That person really does not care about me. And I didn't get involved. I didn't walk into situations like that. Uh, another really great example of how, what um, some of that was, I was in a class with some students who saw me in elementary school when I didn't have that acceptance. It was more reactive and, and a lot more immature. And they tried to get this boy that they thought liked me and he had a girlfriend. And they oh, kept no. and I'm like, I, I don't know that I don't think this person really likes me. And they're like, Oh, he really does. And all oh, that girl's going to beat you up. And I'm like, okay, I'm not falling for this. I don't want to get involved in some love triangle or something like that. And then they kept saying, oh, yes, yeah, you're, you're going to go to the mall and she's going to beat you up. And we, there was an event that we went there and I ended up seeing her and she didn't beat me up. She waved at me. I mean, because she knew I wasn't calling her boyfriend. I wasn't getting involved in the situation, but it was having that acceptance and it was having that love that I learned, okay, this is how a peer acts when they like you. This is how somebody acts when they don't like you. And there were situations I still did walk into as an adult with that, but I started to learn because I had that acceptance with that. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's, uh, yeah. All learning curves, right? Yeah, all things that you had to learn. And so many people that, that have autism or they have other ways with that, it's really hard for them socially when they go into a school. And sometimes with being bullied, I have a unique perspective on what to tell people on situations like that. I can remember I had, when I worked one-on-one -on -one with students, sometimes uh, they were getting picked on. And that, could, that was always a little bit difficult for me. But when I told one of them, I said, you know what I would do? You can report this if you want to, which she did. But I said, if you're being picked on at lunch and nobody wants to sit with you at the lunch table and you don't like those people, just go move to a different table. And if they ask you, just tell them you were trying out a different lunch table. Yeah, and simple, that's what right? the school did too. So I kind of can go in with those little subtle things that somebody can do to improve the situation 
but it's not a big dramatic thing that maybe somebody that's bullying them once. And obviously, if they are getting threats and there is definite harm, to definitely report that. But there's just sometimes some subtle things you can do. But if I didn't go through that, I don't think I would understand how, how to handle those situations. Well, that's the key is to therapy, isn't it? And in, in, in psychologists, mm -hmm. they might be academically trained in certain areas, but is it, is it, is it, power, is it, could it be more powerful if they've experienced it themselves? Like, yeah. Can I really, can mm -hmm. you give advice on something you've never experienced on to the level it probably needs for that individual that's going through it? Right. Uh, on that, do you have, uh, do you see scenarios happening in the modern day at your school and your students that you kind of can relate to? I mean, you kind of just touched on it briefly there because of it, but is there other scenarios that are still like, can you see similarities that are reoccurring in the children's lives now? I can see a lot of that. I, I, I think it's tough when you're the one that's in the classroom and you can't get things. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I can also just see a, a lot of times maybe just subtly how sometimes kids can alienate a child in the classroom that might have a disability and kind of be able to step in and just kind of be that kid's friend or I'll sit with them or uh, or I'll help them out with trying to like socialize. Come on, let's include th this one with that too. We want to make sure that happens. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to say, yeah, there are some situations that have changed, you know, technology is in our classroom, but a lot of it is our kids at that age are still children they're still developing there's still a lot of those things that you that i that i got to see as well uh, maybe the styles have changed the trends but kids are still kids at that age and i think it's yeah. just really important that we kind of go in with that uh, knowledge of development and just sometimes uh ways to just be able to encourage them yeah absolutely yeah that deep meaningful connection right yeah mm-hmm so yeah. for you, you were leaving in, in in Austria, sorry, in America, you leave high school at 18. Is that right? Yeah, 18 or 19, depending on when you started the school system. So for you then, I mean, is there anything that we've missed for, for high school or middle school for you? Is there anything we've missed there or that we need to share that could be significant? I think we got pretty much everything with that, yeah. Okay, because I know the next few years uh, leaving high school was quite pivotal, pivotal for you, wasn't it, as well? How, how was that? Well, how was that pivotal for you, I guess? Right. Well, one of the things I knew I wanted to go to college, but I yeah. was afraid. And I decided, okay, I'm going to move forward. And I got connected with an agency called Office for Vocational Rehabilitation. Uh, in the States, we have a program that's built in with our legislation that provides vocational rehab for individuals that have disabilities. And it's not just learning disabilities. Somebody can go in with back problems, knee problems, or anything else that qualifies under a category of someone having a medical condition. Mm -hmm. And this agency pays for testing. They pay for uh, college. I was able to graduate debt-free. And they pay for job assistance, and which I didn't have much luck with. But one of the things was when I got involved with the agency, I had to get tested for having a learning disability all over again. And I've never been a great test taker. And I scored very low on my exams. And I can remember the psychiatrist who evaluated me said, uh, you're most likely not going to go beyond community college. And, and hearing those words was really discouraging to me because I'm already this young girl. I'm already really scared on how I'm going to handle college. And when I get to college, there was even more stigma. I had people that told me that because of uh, my disability, a professor, that I would most likely not go beyond community college. And disability accommodations were considered cheating or an unfair advantage by my peers. And because of that stigma that just surrounded them, I didn't want to use them. And that was a really big mistake. My grades that were already bad dropped even further. So I just, it was hard for me. And luckily I had a professor that could see that I was really struggling. And what she recommended was, let's get you at least extended test time. Hmm. And once I did that, I was able to pass her class. I did not do well with it, but I was able to pass. And I passed my other courses and I got my associate's degree in early childhood education. I moved out on my own. And during that time, that was really important to me because I'm unable to drive. So I was living in a central location. I was uh, working some temp jobs. I had that independence, but I always wanted more for myself and be careful what you wish for. 
because due to financial reasons, I had to move back in with my mom and dad. And my job was downsizing. And I thought, well, let's look over a university. Let's give that a try. And I found the perfect program that had the least amount of math and science possible and had something that interested me. And it had disability accommodations. And I got in. I had a ride to school. And I was, I used the accommodations. I would introduce myself to professors and say, well, my name is Michelle Steiner. Well, yeah, my name is Michelle and then I have a learning disability and this is what I'm going to need. And I had a note taker, extended test time. And when I used it, my grades improved dramatically. I made Dean's List for a semester and I was able to graduate. Sorry. Oh, Dean's List? Yeah. That means that your grade, I forget what the number was, but my grade, and this was right after I took a, a really bad logics class the next semester, my grades really improved. Uh, so that means I had a really high percent. I don't know if it was a 4.0, but it was very close to having a really, I had really good grades. So the Dean's List is a category over a certain percentage? Mm -hmm. is, right. Yes. Yeah. We a don't percentage. use that terminology. I get it, you know. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. No, 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 no it's fine. That's what my job and is I to never, pull it apart. <laughs> yeah, and I never thought I could do that because I can remember my, one of my cousins got made Dean's List and he was very smart when he yeah. was in college. And I remember I thinking, oh, that'd be so awesome if I made that. And for so many years, it didn't look like I was going to. And I I, I did. I made that list for, for a semester. It wasn't all. Thank you. It wasn't all three years, but or all four years, but I did make it for a semester. And what a progression, though, right? Even just yeah, mentally it, as well, like how it like pumps you up a little bit, doesn't it? And builds you. It, it does. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. In fact, whenever I had that class, the semester before that, when I was taking the, the logics course and I wasn't doing well, the professor was amazing. But And I can remember, though, he was asking me, so what are your grades? Like, And I looked them up. And I would have had a 4.0 if I didn't have this class because it was strength. It was so amazing, though, like when you say how the brain works, hmm. we were putting all this energy into doing math and it wasn't strengthening that side of the brain, but it was strengthening the other sides of my brain. Hmm. <laughs> how? And that's what how happens do you think? when I do. Yeah. When I do math, it does not strengthen the math side. It does not. There's no there's. There's little to no improvement, but my other side of my brain gets stronger. And how do you know that? Because I can look at it whenever I take a lot of the classes, like whenever I, I just look back on that. And I, I was a good student before that, but I didn't get like really great, wonderful grades in my other classes, but I can look back on some of them. And when I looked, when I was taking my other classes, my scores were improving. I had A's and everything else. Mm -hmm. wow. And not the math, but for some reason, the brain just started working overtime with the reading, with the writing, and with the other kinds of thinking, but it just couldn't do it with the math. That's fascinating. Can't prove it. Get... I mean, I can't like get a scan or, you know, improve yeah. what's going on, mm. but that's just, that's just an observation that I made. That... Yeah, the, the anecdotal observations are powerful stuff. I've had more anecdotal observations in the last year in my life, and, and it just confirms and, and concretes what I, you know, believe. Because obviously, I have to say believe with something I don't know mm -hmm. because I can't prove it other than reading the books and the uh, the academic uh, case studies, maybe. But um, yeah, that's it's fascinating. almost like if if you, um, and I mean, I mean to interrupt you, but it's almost like no. if you're blind you pick up more on sound. So we yeah. have a lot of people that might be might be blind and are beautiful singers. That's definitely not me. But or not somebody me. that might be uh, deaf and they can pick up on vision. And the same thing with having, bringing out the details. It's like my brain can bring out details that other people can miss and has those observation skills. What would you say they are, apart from the flowers and, 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 and things like that, what you mentioned when you're driving what are some of the other examples of that then would you say that somebody else doesn't have i think sometimes it's just, it's the noticing things like sometimes people will say when i work with students i can usually notice when somebody's doing something or i might be able to pick up on signs of like somebody's saying something or just how they say something 
like my husband will be like, you pay, I'm terrible at picking up on when people act like that. And I can pick up on some subtle signs. Okay, maybe somebody doesn't like me or maybe somebody does. And just picking up on a lot of those subtle things of, of how to respond to situations like that. So like reading between the lines uh, type of mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. I, I think I, I like to think I'm pretty good at that. I, I, I like to mm-hmm. think that. I, it doesn't mean I am. <laughs> but I yeah. like to look between the gaps of the major points of the day or the moments in times and the little body ling- language of movements of elbows and arms and the, the eyes and what they're thinking. I, I love it. I, I love all that stuff, type of thing. Before you mentioned about having different accommodations uh, given to you during your academic journey, um, but I remember in the pre-chat, that came with a few problems, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. With the academic journey that, that did come with a lot of issues. Anytime I encounter math, it's always a difficult situation for me. Mm. I couldn't even pass uh, the basic math class at community college. So we did do a, a waiver where we did a class substitute for that. And that was because I went through the class and I just couldn't pass it. And I had a disability. So I did submit it to the dean and we did a film analysis as a waiver. When I went to university, I couldn't get a waiver for that, but I took a philosophy-based math class. I had that option, which I'm so glad I did. And I was wondering, should I take that or should I try to do algebra? And I can remember I was playing, there was a chess game and somebody said, hey, do you wanna play chess? And I said, sure. And it was the shortest game in history and I of course lost, (laughs) big surprise there. And the person I was playing with actually was in the math department. I said, oh, yeah, I have a learning disability and I'm really in math. And I'm thinking about, okay, what do I want to uh, end up doing with the math course? Should I take the philosophy based or should I take, you know, like an algebra class? And he said, I think I would really take the the philosophy based class. A lot of the guys in our department aren't aren't the nicest. And when I... Yep, this is coming from somebody for their department that could see that. I get into the department, I get into, took the philosophy based class and I about failed every test, but I was going to class. I went to office hours. I went to hours of tutoring every week and, and we had every accommodation and the teacher knew I was really trying and all I needed was a D to pass and he passed me with a D. Oh. And that's all I needed. Great. That's great. And it worked. Yeah. And, and and I believe, I remember you saying, I don't think you mentioned it earlier. I'm, I'm positive you didn't. But you mentioned in the pre-chat a few, when we spoke a few uh, last month, the other month, about where people uh, perceived people who had extra support as cheaters. Yes. Mm-hmm. How, that, that's, that blows my mind a little bit. How did that yeah, come about? Yeah, I could... I can still, well, when I was in school, a lot of people thought, well, you're getting the answers. I'm thinking, okay, we're, we're still in, we're, we're in college and we're going back into this high school thing where I'm getting yeah. the answers. Nobody gave me the answers. I was given the test. I went to a room and I took it. That, yeah. That's all I got. I had tutoring where we worked on a lot of the assignment, where we worked on it, but I didn't get the answers. And even as an adult, I was at a party a few years ago and somebody was back in school and was taking math and somebody said, oh, that must be really easy. I bet you're taking it online. You can you can use a calculator. And she goes, no, that would be cheating. And hearing those words way after when I was done with school was really heartbreaking because it made me think, OK, am I a cheater? Because but then again, I had to look back and say, no, these are the accommodations that we have to use their tools. And even when I did use a calculator, I couldn't pass. I couldn't yeah. because you could put the numbers in. I was capable of reading the numbers, putting the numbers in. But if you don't understand how they work, hmm. that doesn't solve the problem. No, not at all. And if you can't understand how they work and you know that, then I can kind of look at that as maybe cheating because you understand how they work and you're just, that's where you're not using your brain. For me, I, I, sh- I certainly can punch numbers in, but I don't know how the formula works. I, I, I forget the steps. So really having a calculator does minimal uh, of anything for me. Has, has your condition ever been 
got more deeper in knowledge and you've got more of an understanding of it, you know, whether it's root cause, do we have a root cause? Is there, uh, yeah. Have you got any more information as your life's progressed? We, we're not sure what caused it. I mean, sometimes people can say genetics. They, my parents swear that they have one, but they didn't test people back in that time period. So I don't know if, if they did or if they do or they don't. Um, I might've had a cousin, uh, you know, distant cousin that had it, but I'm not really uh, sure too much mm. about that. I, I know that none of my nieces that, that have come up have had that. And I know my brother did not have, doesn't have that as well. So, I mean, we don't know how genetic it is yeah. and we don't, we're not really sure of the cause. And, mm. but I have understood throughout the years uh, just how it has impacted me. Cause I remember a lot of people telling me, Oh yeah, once you're done with high school, you're never going to have that problem again. And you couldn't, that person could have been more wrong on that because yeah. it does affect so much of my life. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.